Mystery behind the ancient technology of the Gujian sword. Discovered in a submerged tomb in China in 1965, this sword, aged at over 2,400 years, is heralded as one of the sharpest ever made. Astoundingly, despite its age, the blade emerged from its wooden casing gleaming and pristine, bearing two razor-sharp edges. One archaeologist even inadvertently sliced his hand when lightly grazing the blade to gauge its sharpness. Scientific analysis suggests the sword's enduring sharpness can be attributed to a coating of a distinctive alloy known as chromium sulfide. What's intriguing is that chromium sulfide is an elusive metal, necessitating extraction at scorching temperatures close to 2,000 degrees Celsius. This poses the question, how did individuals over 2,400 years ago craft such a sword, particularly when the methodology to extract chromium wasn't developed until 1937? This find reiterates the notion that our ancestors might have held a plethora of advanced technological insights that, for unknown reasons, have faded into obscurity over the millennia. Chuck, back up in this thing with another creepy and scary TikTok reaction video. If you guys haven't already hit that like and subscribe button, go ahead and hit that bell and hit notifications all. I try to get these boys out to you daily. And if this is your first time checking me out, man, I got so many other fire videos you can go back and watch. But today we're looking at that future tech, that ancient. Microchips found in fossils is not a joke, and there have been fossils that have been opened up and things found that were initially said to be microchips. For example, a T-Rex bone that had a microchip found in it, they later said was a fossil of some ancient bacteria. Another one they said was just a bone fragment that looked a whole lot like a microchip. This all relates back to a concept called the Great Reset. Short version for now, the Great Reset says that we constantly exist on a cycle. The idea being we'll all get wiped out, there will be a reset, and then those people People that come however many million years from now will find remnants of our existence and then gather them. Microchips found in fossils. Greek statues were made so well that we can't even recreate them today. So whatever technique they were using back then to get marble to look like this must have been lost. I mean just look at the bins in the clothing how real it looks and look at his beard it actually looks like real hair. Like you could almost just go up there and run your hand through his beard. And some details were so small that we need a microscope from today's time to even see them. This muscle right here only contracts whenever you lift your pinky. And look at Michelangelo's pinky in the statue. And then the muscles contracted. That's crazy detail. Here's a better view of that muscle. All right, there ain't no way someone created this. I mean, just look at the veil across this lady's face. And they're saying that someone in 1500 created this with a freaking chisel. Just look at the veil on her face. It looks so real, you can just go up and remove it. All right, someone's got some explaining to do on this one because ain't no way that somebody made this with a freaking chisel. The marble is rolled to look like a real blanket. I mean, that's like a petrified person right there. And what's crazy is none of these statues have any chisel marks or scratches. I find it pretty hard to believe that someone thousands of years ago created something so perfect. Whatever the Egyptians were doing, I think they were the most advanced civilization that ever existed. I don't think we could do what they did. The precision in which they built it, I really don't think we can do that. Just the symmetry of the faces of the statues is unparalleled and they're immense. These are monstrously huge, perfectly symmetrical faces. Right. Their, their temples are insanely intricate. They were incredibly advanced. Incredibly advanced. With math, with science, with technology. F certainly with geometry. 20 ton gigantic stone blocks that were taken from a mountain 500 miles right. away. And no one has any idea how the fuck they got them. Nobody there. has any clue. No guesses. Right. There's some guesses about, oh, maybe the river system was different back then. Whatever. How right. are you getting that 50 ton chunk of granite no out of a fucking mountain and it's moving insane. it down, even with modern equipment? How are you getting it over the mountain? Thank you. 
How deep it is in there. Where is this? Oh, oh jetzt sind wir unten. Vorher mal oben schauen, das kann man unten. Oh, cool. side of it I guess There's no way they got him in the car with a Benz. Come on, y'all. Sound. Pyramids. Man, that is interesting. What type of inter instrument was that? It, that was just pure sound that levitated that rock, and he was able to transport that to one distance to another. Interesting what you can do with sound. Ancient technology from the past. This is the Lycurgus Cup. It is an ancient wonder from the Roman Empire. When light hits it from the front, the glass glows green. When lit from the back, it glows red. This glass was made with silver and gold particles 50 nanometers in diameter. That is less than 1,000th the size of salt. This cup is so advanced that it changes colors when different liquids are poured into it. 
It also changes with different temperatures. It was given to the British Museum in the 1950s by the Rothschilds. I wonder what else they got. Like and follow for more. For time. Today, we're looking at the most impressive technology from the past, ancient Egyptian locks. Using only a few pieces of wood, ancient Egyptians created one of the world's first locks more than 2,000 years ago. First, they drilled three holes into the top piece of wood and filled each hole with a wooden dowel. Then you could only open the door with a specially fitted wooden key that pushes the dowels up. World War II Buttons Compass The British Royal Air Force discovered an amazing invention during World War II that allowed pilots to remove two buttons from their uniforms and create an emergency compass. In case a pilot crashed in unfamiliar territory, the buttons held a magnetic charge and would point them towards safety. Rolagon Off-Roader Back in the 1950s, an inventor named William Albee was on a fishing trip in Alaska and had the incredible idea to build a truck with a rolling balloon instead of wheels. The balloon allowed the world's first off-roader to absorb bumps and travel over any terrain. Kind of advanced ancient technology. What do all of these have in common? First of all... Have you heard of the Greek computer that is thousands of years old? It's an ancient Greek analog computer that was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses for calendrical and astrological purposes. Discovered in 1901 in the Antikythera shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island of Antikythera, it's considered to be one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. The mechanism dates back to the 2nd century BC and consists of a complex system of at least 30 bronze gears, dials, pointers, and inscriptions. It's been compared to a mechanical cosmos and is thought to have been operated by turning a hand crank. By manipulating the various dials and pointers, the user could track the cycles of the sun, moon, and planets, as well as predict eclipses and other astronomical events. Despite its advanced technology and sophistication, the Antikythera mechanism was largely unknown until its rediscovery in the 20th century. But they opened up a grave in South America. The grave was probably made about a thousand years ago uh, uh, and found a, this little uh, gold artifact in there. You can see it next to the dime for scale. Little uh, looks like an airplane about this big. The Smithsonian has it and they have it labeled as a stylized insect because they got this preconceived idea, ancient man was dumb, modern man is smart, they could not possibly have known about airplanes a thousand years ago. And yet, here they've got one. That's not a stylized insect. I'm sorry, they knew about flight. An Egyptian tomb was opened as 2100 years old, and it also had an airplane in it, a little model glider. How did they know about airplanes over 2000 years ago? Apparently they knew about electricity a long time ago because this battery uh, was found in Iraq from about uh, 2,000 years ago. The Egyptians must have known about electricity. This hieroglyphic shows what appears to be wires and a generator or something hooked up to these uh, two snakes. Either the snakes are producing the electricity or they're putting electricity into the snakes. I don't know, but they must have known about uh, electricity a long time ago. They found a sunken ship in the Aegean Sea, which is near Greece in the Mediterranean, and there was uh, encrusted on there what appeared to be an analog computing device. This is uh, 2,100 years ago. This hammer was found in uh, rocks supposed to be 400 million years old by a lady in Texas. Battelle Laboratory said it's 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, 0.74% sulfur. No carbon, and yet it is stainless steel. It won't, it, won't rot. it won't rust. Before the flood came, the Bible says the people lived to be over 900 years old. You could learn a lot in 900 years. Plus, when you consider a couple other factors, they lived in a perfect environment. They would have had much higher IQs, much uh, less to do as far as just daily things you have to do just to live. Most of those things are taken care of in the Garden of Eden. Don't need a house. you got perfect weather. So they can devote all their time to uh, study or learning things. Plus, Adam came pre-programmed from the hand of God, probably had an incredibly high IQ. And he got to walk and talk with God for a while till he sinned, maybe 100 years. We don't know. But uh, got to walk and talk with God. The other factor to consider is Adam lived long enough to know his great, 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 great grandson. Noah's daddy could have known Adam for 56 years. So you get not only a much greater starting, uh, a much higher starting point, they already knew a lot because God pre-programmed it into Adam. Plus they lived a long time and could learn a lot more. Plus they lived long enough to pass this on to many generations. Today an awful lot of knowledge goes to the grave. You know, about the time you know it all, you're, you die. Uh, or you, by the time you know a bunch of stuff, you die. Imagine if guys like Einstein could live 
you know, eight or nine hundred years, how much could they, how much knowledge could they accumulate in a brain like that? But they opened up a grave in South America. The grave was probably made about a thousand years. hundred BC. Wait a second. Wrong photo. Here we go, a 2000 year old computer. This ancient device thought to be created in the year 100 BC was found off the coast of Greece in the Mediterranean Sea. Over 2000 years ago, people of ancient Greek were advanced enough to develop what we now consider a computer, an analog computer, meaning it was spun by hand, but nonetheless a computer. Here's a reconstruction of what they expected to look like, it contained over 30 different gears, and they used it to keep track of lunar phases, when a solar eclipse might happen. They even used it to keep track of their four-year Olympic Games. What makes this one ancient artifact so interesting in human history is because we have not found anything else even remotely close to the complexity since discovering this back in 1901. You'd think if they had something this advanced, if they had an actual computer, they would have stepping stones that got them there and probably more than just one, don't you think? What weirds me out is that we have not been able to find anything else until a millennium later when medieval cathedral clocks were created. This is still my favorite photo of it though, it's if you could see through the wooden box that housed all the gears. Follow me if you know there's more to history than what we're led to believe. The first computer ever created- Tomb, symbolic or literal tombs. Well if you don't subscribe to that then you might want to listen up because I have two contending theories as to what the original purpose of the pyramids were. So the first theory, which I came across on YouTube, there's a guy called Jeffrey Drum, and he makes a YouTube channel called Land of Chem, as in chemistry. And he's proposing the theory that the ancient pyramids originally were basically industrial chemical plants, and that there is a lot of evidence that backs up uh, this theory. Now, what I love about this theory is that every single pyramid is accounted for in the theory and has its own specific individual use. Whereas other theories tend to just focus on the Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, and doesn't really include uh, or take into account all of the different designs of every single different pyramid. Researchers from the ACEDA project, and you can check it out online, acedaproject.org, they went and they swab tested loads of the ancient pyramids in Egypt and they found that there was different chemical compounds and metallic elements found in each pyramid. So first up we have the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, supposedly the first pyramid uh, built in Egypt and originally it was done in three stages one two three and originally it was literally just a huge sheer drop into the ground with I think up to 11 shafts and on subterranean tunnels um, and some sort of like access shaft which is not accessible for humans it's sort of impossible to get in and out of this huge sheer drop and access shaft and the theory is is that this was for producing methane gas so they would collect dung cow dung and put it into the pit, add water and have a chemical reaction to make methane gas. It's interesting to note that this exact area of Saqqara, the later dynasties were known for praising sacred cows, sacred bulls. There was a whole religion obsessed with cows. Could this be connected to the fact that it used to be a methane plant? Also, the Egyptians were obsessed with the sacred dung beetle, literally an animal that collected dung, which is what you'd need to do to create methane. Okay, here's what it looks like looking straight down the drop shaft of the Pyramid of Saqqara. You have got this uh, huge sarcophagus at the bottom, which I believe is copper lined and has like a kind of cork stop removable lid thing which why would you need to remove the lid for a dead body do you know what i mean uh, ironically that's what you do need to contain methane you would need a copper lined something with access to the box of methane and you can see above here um this is the s severely sloped access shaft which you can't get in and out of that you drop at least 40 foot so looking at it like this i can completely see how this would be a manure pit methane gas production place now why would the ancient egyptians or pre-ancient egyptians need or use methane gas you can use it for heating and lighting you can use it in the process of smelting for metalwork it can also be used to synthesize other chemicals and gases which might explain what the pyramid next door was doing now, a stone's throw away from the Step Pyramid, we have the Red Pyramid of Dashur, which has one of the most 
interesting chemical compounds found in any of the pyramids in Egypt. And also, you don't even need a chemical analysis to understand this one. If you have a nose that works, you can observe this for yourself. To this day, the Red Pyramid reeks of ammonia. Now, I know what ammonia smells like because I bleach my hair. The minute that I entered this pyramid, we were all hit with this intense, hot smell of ammonia, which some people say, that's my dog fighting. Some people say, oh, it's because bats get into the, the Red Pyramid, so it must be the, the piss from the bats. But bats are in many other pyramids in ancient Egypt and none of them smell of ammonia just this one. But we don't just smell it. The stone is literally secreting. You can see this like sort of dark black stuff. It's literally secreting ammonia out of the stone, as well as iron and aluminium oxides. Now the layout of the red pyramid chambers, we're going to call them reaction chambers, is the exact same as the modern chemical reaction chambers that you would need to create ammonia. Now, why would you need three chambers to bury just one dead pharaoh? Egyptologists tell us it was because it was an attempt to deter the grave robbers, but they are very specific and too precise. It's also a lot of effort to do. So we've got the step pyramid supposedly making methane gas, and then you've got the red pyramid down the road taking that methane gas and transforming it into ammonia. And that brings us to the next pyramid in the line, the bent pyramid, which takes that liquid form ammonia and transforms it into a solid. Now, this theory is replicated again on the Giza Plateau, with each pyramid producing a specific chemical compound, and then the next pyramid changing that compound like a production line. So this is the inside of the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. You can see we've got these water inlet shafts. And they're in this theory, there is evidence that the satellite pyramids were part of the complex and used as like water hydraulic press because these pyramids needed to be pumped with water in order for the chemical reactions to take place. You've got the King's Chamber up here, which is like the furnace or main reaction chamber going into the Grand Gallery, where the gases would meet the rising water and the chemical reaction would take place there. And then we've got the Queen's Chamber, which is like an extraction chamber, which is going to separate the gas uh, and create a dilute form of sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid can be used for mining, it can be used for pigments, dyes, it can be used for uh, explosives, it can be used for metal. Met Metallurgy, can't say that. Drugs and detergents. So the chemical analysis of the first pyramid is pointing to a dilute liquid sulfuric acid, which the second pyramid would then take and turn into a hydrochloric acid solution, which can be used in water purification or making iron oxide. There are so many other elements to this theory that I can't get into now. But for example, there are things that are on the outside of the pyramid that are really overlooked, like this almost like portcullis. There is a carved granite, which obviously had sort of a sliding mechanism. Uh, there's a similar thing found inside the Great Pyramid, but this is on the outside, which leads the, to the idea, was there an inlet shaft on the outside for filling the pyramid with chemicals or water as and when needed. Again, you wouldn't need a working portcullis if it was a tomb to be sealed and someone buried in. I really recommend taking a deep dive into the pyramid chemical plant theory because there are some bits of evidence that are real brain teasers. Like for example, some of the metal compounds and chemical compounds that are literally seeping out of the stones from inside the pyramid could only have been made at specific temperatures. The lead and zinc compounds that are found coming out of the stone could only have melted and gone into the stone at these temperatures, 327 degrees centigrade and 419. That is a very hot temperature. There was something going on inside the pyramids that was incredibly hot, according to the chemical compounds found. It's also interesting to note that the very the word pyramid, which is Greek, means fire in the middle. So were these pyramids chemical plants? It's very simple science. It's not anything woo-woo or very high-tech. It's simple science. And it also answers why the hell would there be this mass effort from civilization to make these things? Because they were producing things that were beneficial for civilization, as opposed to all of these things for like one dead pharaoh, 
it, 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 it doesn't make as much sense as something that was going to benefit your agriculture. So yeah, what do you think? Shout out to Funny Old World for that. That was putting me on. The, I always knew that they had some type of electricity, but turning it into a chemical plant, man, that is new. Built as one in an enormous network of power plants. Christopher Dunn's theories indicate that some of these pyramids had chemicals mixed in them. And in fact, studies of his working devices have shown that this probably would work. Pyramids were actually geomechanical devices. In other words, they were attached to the earth. They were tuned to vibrate with the frequencies of the earth and they converted the energies of the earth into electromagnetic energy. Best example of this is in the, the Great Pyramid. It's probably the most precise structure on the planet. According to Christopher Dunn's theory, the process of generating energy began with drawing water from the nearby Nile River to the base of the Great Pyramid. One theory held by numerous scientists and archaeoengineers is that the pyramid The Great Pyramids used as an unlimited energy source? The most commonly accepted theory is that the Great Pyramids were used as tombs for Egyptian pharaohs. But a recent study has revealed that under the right conditions, the Pyramids of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy. They are located at the exact point on Earth which magnifies the electromagnetic forces of the planet, where electric currents are at their strongest. Also. Materials used in the inner surfaces of the pyramids are very good at increasing the conductivity of electricity, and when done in this particular way, it can cause large currents of electricity to flow. Archaeologists have also found what they believe to be giant batteries in an inaccessible room hidden away for thousands of years appearing to be purposefully hidden by the structure's engineers. If the ancient Egyptians had electricity, it would explain why so many ancient carvings seem to depict giant light bulbs. It would also explain were the Great Pyramids used as an unlimited energy source? The Great Pyramid was actually a great power generator that when tuned correctly could have actually acted as a power plant, which at first, I know, sounds ridiculous, but that doesn't change the fact that it is a very real possibility because found within the Great Pyramid, more specifically, the shafts that connect to the Queen's Chamber, which, by the way, no one has ever been able to explain, scientists discovered traces of zinc and hydrochloric acid, Yes, during the excavations and research of the Egyptian pyramids, archaeologists didn't find any ancient devices that might need electricity. But they found rather strange hieroglyphs found in the Hathor Temple, located in the Egyptian city of Dendera. Some see this drawing as an analog of a modern light bulb. If so, it turns out that the Egyptians used electricity as early as 2250 BC. Perhaps it was even electrical technology that helped the Egyptians build such large-scale structures without exhausting human labor. Let's assume that the destruction of the ancient Egyptian station in the form of a pyramid didn't happen. Then, we wouldn't consider the wealthiest country to be Luxembourg, while the most electricity-selling country wouldn't be Canada. The most advanced countries, along with Egypt, would be Turkey, Italy, Great Britain, and the USA. After all, ancient granite obelisks were found there, which means that wireless communications would have appeared there in the first place. Yes, this is what radio towers would look like now. Perhaps instead of Potala Palace, Leaning Tower of Pisa, and the Eiffel Tower, pyramids would now stand. After all, Italy, India, and China are rich in granite, and these countries could well afford the construction of the same power plants as in ancient Egypt. Yes. And he's got an excellent point. If they just 
put their resources together and try to recreate this and man and generate this type of energy for people it would be outstanding we on these energized waters today baby let's go So if you realize, if you look at the, if you do a rewind on the geological clock of Giza, you find out that the Nile ran right up next to the pyramids. Now, when you take magnetized crystal granite, which is the base, and you use running water underneath it, you create physiostatic electricity. Then the granite will pull the ions up into the pyramid, send them up the Grand Gallery. Now, the Grand Gallery has these slots on each side they could have been resonating on something to amp up step up the electricity as it went up into the king's chamber in the king's chamber here's what's interesting there's a box in there that they try to say it's a sarcophagus it's not a sarcophagus i'm six foot four i can't fit in that box you see what a real sarcophagus is these things are massive not this little tiny box the box is the exact dimensions though of the ark of the covenant the ark of the covenant used to sit inside of that box it was technology it was a capacitor and that would then give the extra boost and send the electricity up through the apex where there was a gold capstone. The obelisk, which are crystal, magnetized crystal granite, would capture that ambient wireless electricity and then pass it on to what they call jed pillars. They had these jeds. They're depicted in many hieroglyphs, people holding them and connecting them to light bulbs and electroplating devices in hieroglyphs, which I took everybody to go see. So if you realize, if you look at the, if you do a rewind, Jet pillars? Is that what he just said? Jet pillars? That's how they were being able to conduct the wireless electricity. Jet pillars. Described the Great Pyramid. I described it as a, a coupled oscillator in that it was connected to the Earth. Its proportions were an integer to the Earth mm -hmm. and it was tuned harmonically to the vibrations of the Earth. That was what I proposed. And as such, it reacted to the, the Earth's pulse or the Earth's vibration. Through that, they were able to stimulate uh, electron flow in the central granite chamber and produce microwave energy. What type of machine? It's, it's when you start looking at the schematics of the Great Pyramid and the unusual uh, interior design. It has no, it doesn't represent any kind of structure or building where people would uh, spend any time in at all. It, they weren't just experimenting, they had mastered uh, tapping into electromagnetic energy. And, uh, the fundamental function of the Great Pyramid, it's not just about electromagnetic energy, but it's also relieving stresses in the Earth. So it's multifunctional. It allows you to re relieve stresses in the earth so that, that it would uh, eliminate uh, the, the destruction of earthquakes. It's clear throughout Egypt that they uh, were using very, very large machines, mega machines. Explorers, researchers who have uh, visited the Great Pyramid have noticed that, that there has been, there is a very unusual uh, acoustic effect inside the Great Pyramid. In the, in the Giza power plant theory, it explains the reason for the giant uh, granite beams above the king's chamber. And it's theorized that those beams were, were actually tuned to respond to sound generated within, within the Great Pyramid. It's uh, very complex and uh, there's, there's nothing out of place, nothing was done accidentally. I mean, it's, it was all perfectly engineered. As far as the uh, a system itself, it's, uh, it's pretty perfect. The, uh, I, I proposed in the in the uh, Giza power plant that they delivered chemicals to the Queen's Chamber. Both the North and South Shaft deli delivered chemicals to the Queen's Chamber uh, that uh, mixed and uh, boiled off hydrogen.
Man, that's how they did it right there. Hold it, here it is. This is how they were catching it from the pyramids. Whatever these structures are, that's how they were getting the energy. All right, y'all, if y'all made it this far, drop the 100s in the comments so I know you real, man. That's it for today's episode, man. Happy Friday. I hope you guys enjoyed this one on Egyptian power plants. I did want to get into some maps, but that gives us something to talk about tomorrow, and I'm going to dive fully into those. I look forward to you guys on the next episode, and thank you for watching. Peace.